Good morning, everybody. Buongiorno a tutti. Uh, I hope that you can have your headphones taken. Uh, if, if not, please, you can collect those uh, in the direzione when you uh, have your registration. Quando avete fatto la vostra registrazione, vicino è possibile uh, avere le cuffie per la traduzione simultanea. Uh, questa mattinata, come tutte le sessioni, uh, saranno in, in italiano e in inglese, quindi i relatori alterneranno italiano e inglese. This session in the morning will be in Italian in English, so uh, people can speak both languages and there will be a, a simultaneous translation. So please uh, use your headphones when needed. Uh, we will start because we have a long day uh, with a very dense, uh, intense program. Uh, I will talk in English because of the with respect of, to our international colleagues. Here we are very proud to host this uh, international conference called uh, Good Practice Services, Promoting Human Rights and Recovery in Mental Health. This is the title that we agreed with the World Health Organization, <coughs> Geneva, uh, and uh, other organization has contributed to this uh, a great event, uh, and we are proud to have you here for the next uh, three or four days, because the fourth day there will be the visit to uh, the mental health services in Trieste and in some places of the region nearby. <clears throat> so, uh, have a great experience, I hope. Uh, I'm sorry because of the limited capacity of this theater. Uh, we have uh, about 400 registration. Not, not all the people will be the three days or four days, so we uh, uh, reasonably think that there will be a seat for everybody. If not, there are connections by TV cable uh, in the direzione, in two rooms, so you can stay there, relax, and listen to what are the, the presentations saying. Uh, okay, and... Uh, I will start with the uh, uh, welcome uh, of the authorities. Here uh, we, are, uh, we have the, uh, director, the, dir the two directors of uh, healthcare unit uh, ASUITS, Azienda Sanitaria Universitaria Integrata di Trieste. Uh, and uh, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Antonio Poggiana, who is the, uh, gen the general manager, the commissario straordinario, because he is uh, making a, gr a great work to uh, 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 merge two organizations, which one is Trieste and the other is from Gorizia and Monfalcone, so it become, will become a bigger organization in a few months. So it's a, it's a very complicated and <laughs> important role. Uh, but for mental health, we are happy because the same practices are done in the whole region, so we, I think we have no problem to uh, work with our colleagues. So we are expecting, we are waiting for this new organization. And uh, uh, Dottoressa uh, Adele Maggiore, who is the health director, Direttrice Sanitaria uh, in our healthcare agency. So I, I leave the floor to, to them, to uh, Dr. Antonio Poggiano. <laughs> Grazie. Grazie Roberto, buongiorno a tutti e innanzitutto benvenuti. E a questo convegno eh, importante voluto dall'Organizzazione Mondiale, Mondiale della Sanità che ha chiesto al suo centro collaboratore che è il Dipartimento di Salute Mentale dell'Azienda Sanitaria Universitaria di Trieste diretto dal dottor Roberto Menzina una forte collaborazione ha preso come riferimento Trieste perché eh, voi sapete meglio di me che da ormai decenni a Trieste si è lavorato, si sta lavorando su un modello che è preso da riferimento da tutti i paesi del mondo. Eh, il convegno ha avuto una altissima partecipazione, più di 400 iscritti, mi diceva il dottor Mezzini, Mezzina, limitando per le capacità limitate dei nostri posti, eh, oltre 44 paesi da tutto il mondo e quindi questo significa che l'importanza e l'attenzione sui modelli che sono stati sviluppati in quest'area sono sicuramente validi. Eh, da anni ci si muove cercando di dare a eh, queste persone una eh, dignità di vita, una, stressando i concetti di autonomia e di inclusione sociale. 
credo che i risultati che eh, nel tempo gli operatori hanno portato a casa siano, eh, dimostrino la validità di questo modello. Per cui a me non resta che ringraziare tutti quelli che negli anni hanno contribuito eh, lavorando con passione, con eh, dedizione a queste attività, noi ci crediamo, stiamo frequentando i posti di quello che fu diciamo, l'artefice di questa rivoluzione, una rivoluzione culturale prima che sanitaria direi, eh, Teatrino Basaglia, eh, Franco Basaglia ha lavorato qui, ha lavorato a Gorizia, quindi anche nella fusione a cui si riferiva prima il dottor Mezzina eh, andiamo verso quella eh, completa eh, unione fra territori che ha visto nascere qui la eh, legge Basaglia e tutto quello che ne è conseguito. Io vi auguro buon eh, proseguimento dei lavori, so che è una settimana molto impegnativa, vedrà eh, oltre 100 relatori che si alterneranno nei vari temi faccio a tutti un augurio di buon lavoro vi porto i saluti del vicepresidente l'assessore Riccardo Riccardi che doveva essere qui ma in questo periodo proprio legato alla fusione all'anno di trasformazione non ha potuto essere presente ma mi ha assicurato che farà il possibile per portarvi i suoi saluti nei prossimi giorni quindi io eh, vi Spero che abbiate la possibilità e lui abbia la possibilità di incontrarvi come qualche altro funzionario della direzione. E il Presidente della terza commissione, il consigliere Ivo Moras, mi pare domani mattina sarà presente. Quindi diciamo che l'attenzione da parte di chi si occupa in questa regione di programmazione sanitaria, di pianificazione e dei nuovi modelli di assistenza è attiva, soprattutto su una convegno, un evento così importante. Grazie e buon lavoro a tutti. Buongiorno a tutti, good morning. Eh, ovviamente quello di cui si parlerà in queste giornate per noi è molto importante in questo momento di programmazione sanitaria in questo momento in cui dobbiamo rivedere i nostri servizi eh, e di riferimento sicuramente per, per quello che è stata l'organizzazione dell'attività territoriale eh, in questa città eh, l'ha fatta da padrone tutta quella che è stata l'esperienza della salute mentale eh, per cui mi aspetto molto oh, dai risultati di questa giornate e vi auguro buon lavoro. Grazie, adesso iniziamo con una serie di prime presentazioni, we start with some presentation, eh, c'è un video de, di saluto della dottoressa Deborah Kestel che è la eh, direttrice del Dipartimento di Salute Mentale e Abuso di Sostanze dell'Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità a Ginevra che in questo momento è a New York per l'Assemblea Generale dell'ONU eh, e quindi nel suo ruolo istituzionale non ha potuto essere qui ma ci ha tenuto a inviarci questo messaggio in italiano perché lei parla italiano avendo lavorato qui, proprio qui a Trieste e in Regione. Grazie. Andiamo avanti. Buongiorno. Sono Deborah Kestel, sono la direttrice del Dipartimento di Salute Mentale e Uso di Sostanze dell'Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità e ehm, ringrazio eh, l'invito che mi è stato fatto di ehm, inviarvi un saluto in questo modo visto che non sono riuscita a, a partecipare di persona per cui eccomi, buongiorno ehm, cari colleghi, cari amici e amiche di, di Trieste e di tanti luoghi che ehm, hanno deciso di, 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 di partecipare a questo, a questo evento ehm, è un, un dispiacere non essere lì con voi ehm, però eh, ci tenevo a Ehm, a farvi avere eh, questi, questi messa questo messaggio. Ehm, per quelli che non mi conoscono io eh, cominciai la mia, il mio percorso professionale ehm, 
a, a Trieste tanti anni fa purtroppo e, dove e, occupai diversi mi dedicai a diversi eh, lavori occupai diversi ruoli e ebbi la, 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 la fortuna di eh, formarmi con eh, alcuni tra i migliori eh, esperti che ci sono eh, secondo me eh, tutt'oggi a livello mondiale e quindi quell'esperienza eh, fatta a, a Trieste, quella, quel, quel modo di, di concepire eh, eh, la salute mentale ma soprattutto le persone con eh, problemi di, di salute mentale è, è un, un insegnamento che mi sono portata eh, con me e eh, dovunque sia andata e che eh, ho oggi con me in questo ruolo eh, che occupo. E, tra, tra le cose principali che secondo me ehm, Trieste ha, ha, ha sviluppato negli anni, che io immagino ci sia in qualche modo in questi giorni ehm, discussione intorno a questi stessi principi, sono, eh, è la questione dei diritti, la questione dei diritti umani delle persone con, eh, come dicevo, con, con problemi di salute mentale e, e i diritti di cittadinanza che se ne parlava ehm, allora ehm, e che sono ovviamente validi tutt'oggi. Eh, questi eh, diritti e la persona al centro della dell'attenzione, dell'organizzazione dei servizi è quello che in qualche modo ha caratterizzato eh, dal mio punto di vista eh, l'esperienza di Trieste e che ha permesso poi lo sviluppo di una rete eh, molto ricca di, di servizi che si è costituita a, intorno ai bisogni della persona e non eh, all'incontrario uh, seguendo le logiche istituzionali no? quindi ehm, i servizi eh, nella comunità i centri di salute mentale eh, i servizi per le crisi le, le situazioni acute eh, nell'ospedale generale ma anche eh, le cooperative anche ehm, gli spazi di, di, di ricreativi ehm, eh, Purtroppo ho, ho saputo eh, stamattina, ieri sera, de, de, della scomparsa di, di, di Claudio e, e insomma, vabbè, <ride> e, alcuni de, 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 alcune de, delle persone che hanno eh, sicuramente segnato eh, questo modo di, di porsi davanti alla malattia mentale, davanti alla sofferenza, non dimenticando la persona eh, per l'appunto al centro dell'attenzione e quindi servizi che si sono, uh, che, che, si, che sono cambiati negli anni ma che sono sempre stati ehm, sviluppati con questa preoccupazione, sto pensando alle tante residenze, alle tante modalità di, di, di lavoro ehm, generate negli anni e tante altre che, eh, di cui magari non sono perfettamente aggiornata. Credo che quello ha fatto scuola, ha fatto scuola in, in quel modo di, di, di organizzarsi, di lavorare, ha fatto scuola, dicevo, eh, sicuramente in, in giro per l'Italia, ma anche in tanti paesi, eh, tanti diversi paesi al mondo e probabilmente eh, tanti di quelli sono oggi lì, eh, in questo momento, proprio perché eh, hanno voluto eh, vedere con, con, o toccare con le proprie mani quello che è stato fatto e imparare ancora di più eh, come si fa. E, purtroppo a livello mondiale ce n'è eh, sicuramente una maggiore consapevolezza attorno alle eh, questioni di salute mentale, se ne parla di più, ce ne sono più mh, momenti eh, in cui eh, a livello mh, di, di, di alto livello di personalità politiche o, o Nazioni Unite o ehm, anche ehm, del mondo mediatico eccetera parlano della salute mentale e questo sicuramente aiuta, aiuterà a ehm, vincere lo stigma, la discriminazione e magari ad un certo punto anche a, ad aumentare ehm, le risorse disponibili perché eh, questo volevo anche dire quando ho iniziato questa frase che purtroppo ce n'è ancora tanto da fare purtroppo a livello mondiale eh, le risorse disponibili per la salute mentale sono molto basse e se guardiamo i dati ehm, a livello anche della regione europea sono eh, più bassi di quello che si 
potrebbe immaginare o si potrebbe desiderare, e, però a livello mondiale sicuramente la situazione è ancora abbastanza eh, negativa, si parla di un 2% del, del um, budget de dedicato alla salute, la salute pubblica, solo il 2% va alla salute mentale e purtroppo di quel 2% attorno all'80% va ancora a sostenere le istituzioni psichiatriche, gli ospedali psichiatrici, se, beh, psichiatrici scusate, ehm, vecchio stile con le persone sicuramente abbandonate eh, non prese cura e, e, con violazione dei diritti umani e via dicendo, quindi e ce n'è ancora tanto da fare e, e l'esperienza di Trieste come di parecchi sicuramente di quelli che sono adesso lì ad ascoltare sono dei modelli de, dei quali noi stiamo cercando di, eh, di imparare, di sistematizzare, di promuovere, di riprodurre, di riproporre e, e quindi in questa fase, in questi anni speriamo di eh, riuscire a portare avanti un, un, un lavoro che, 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 che è cominciato tanti anni fa e se non sbaglio eh, il mio predecessore è lì seduto tra di voi e, quindi è cominciato tanti anni fa che adesso c'è un, 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 una nuova spinta eh, per eh, riuscire finalmente a più massivamente speriamo a cambiare eh, i servizi quindi e, questo è il mio messaggio uh, imparate tanto scambiate tante, tante esperienze e, e poi raccontateci, raccontateci quello che funziona quello che non funziona come eh, fare meglio come contribuire a disseminare ancora più eh, ampiamente quello che eh, sappiamo eh, funziona sappiamo eh, va eh, verso eh, una migliore attenzione alle eh, persone con disagio mentale, le loro famiglie, le comunità e che ruolo abbiamo tutti, noi come Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità, eh, i Ministeri della Sanità, della Salute, eh, che ruolo hanno le comunità stesse. Eh, la salute mentale è un problema ehm, che non può essere lasciato eh, esclusivamente nelle mani dei professionisti della salute mentale. E vogliamo di più e quindi voilà, niente questo è, è il mio messaggio sto guardando il tempo si sta facendo un po' lungo quindi eh, vi saluto ho deciso di parlare in italiano perché me lo posso permettere e, e so che ci sarà la traduzione due parole per finire e grazie e, e spero veramente di e, imparare e, sul, sul, sulle conclusioni, su, sui seguenti passi, su passi successivi che saranno decisi eh, dopo questi giorni di lavoro. E in bocca al lupo, uh, abbiate un buon, un buon, una buona conferenza, un buon uh, lavoro. Ciao, goodbye. <ride>
Um, I'd also, of course, like to express my gratitude um, to the organisers of this conference, the Trieste WHO Collaborating Centre, Dr Mazina and his large team, who, in fact, have dedicated this whole conference um, to the issue of human rights and the recovery approach. And it's really these two issues which are the burning issues in mental health. And if we can address these issues, we can transform what's happening in mental health to everyone's benefit. I believe that we have a couple of very exciting days ahead of us, um, all with the purpose of opening up our minds and ideas to the different possibilities for community-based mental health services and supports, no matter what country in the world, and no matter the income level of the country, uh, we hear consistent reports about the poor quality services being provided and about human rights violations and disempowering messages uh, that people experience when they actually go to the mental health services. So I really firmly believe that there is a new opening now. There's um, an opening in the landscape for all of that to change. The time is really ripe for change. At the level of the United Nations, we're seeing unprecedented calls for introducing a human rights, person-centered, and recovery approach to mental health care. At the government level, we're seeing increased awareness and dialogue on the urgent need to address the mental health needs of populations in ways that people find helpful and beneficial. And at the civil society level, we're also hearing the voices of people with psychosocial disabilities and their supporters becoming louder and stronger. I'd just like to conclude um, my sort of opening welcome uh, remarks by saying that this conference is an opportunity to seize the moment and to think hard about the services and supports that we are providing around the world and how we can do things differently in ways that are effective and in ways that people find acceptable and helpful. I look forward to many different stimulating discussions over the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, also for the support to our experience. And uh, I, I uh, give the floor to uh, leave the floor to Dan Chisol, who is program manager for mental health in uh, uh, WHO Regional Office for Europe. In fact, is the responsible for WHO in Europe for mental health. So, buongiorno, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be back here in Trieste. I believe I was here two years ago. Um, for, for this conference and uh, yeah, I'm here to represent the WHO Regional Office for Europe along with my colleague uh, Melita Merko who's just here. Um, I would also like to very much thank uh, Roberto, the local conference organizers as well as the local authorities for, for hosting all 400 of us here uh, in Trieste this week. I think this conference is getting bigger and bigger each year. I think uh, it's the sign of uh, success. Um, so, um, I also, I, I think um, we, we all need know that uh, Roberto is um, uh, due to step down uh, from certain positions next uh, uh, next week. So, uh, I, I'm sure there'll be opportunities over the couple of next couple of days uh, for more uh, extensive eulogies. But just to take the opportunity now to uh, to thank you so much for all the hard work over the many many years, uh, both as the head of the mental health department here, but also as the head of the uh, the WHO Collaborating Centre. Thank you. So um, I think you've already heard from um, Devorah and Michelle, so you don't need to hear another WHO person say the same thing. So I, I will restrict my words just to a special welcome, in fact, to um, delegations from several countries who are working uh, closely with the, the regional office uh, on promoting and implementing a rights-based, person-centered, and recovery-orientated approach to mental health service development um, over the last couple of years. So I'll just mention the countries um, and ask them. Uh, so we have here delegates from, from Croatia, from Czech Republic, uh, from Slovakia, uh, from Latvia and Lithuania, um, also Romania, and finally, a big delegation from Turkey 
and also Armenia. Okay, so many of them are here. If you could put your hands up, please, so that we can identify you to people. Okay, thanks very much. So you might be thinking, okay, why, why are they here exactly? Uh, obviously is to, uh, to share their uh, experiences with each other about uh, some of the, uh, the experiences that they've had, the successes, the challenges, and so on. Uh, but it's also to expose them to the many good practices that we'll be hearing about over the next uh, couple of days. Um, we are going to take the opportunity to have a, a kind of a small, uh, it's called closed, it sounds very exclusive, but a, an internal project meeting basically to, to catch up with things. But we will also immediately thereafter share in a plenary session uh, some of the key messages coming out of that and the plans for some of these countries in the next uh, couple of years. Um, we've also scheduled on Wednesday something uh, called a marketplace, which uh, you know, gave, I think, Roberto the jitters, um, you're wondering what this on earth is, was about. But a market is a marketplace is where buyers and sellers come together, right? And uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the, the buyers, uh, in a loose sense, are the country delegates, you know, who uh, we want to kind of match up uh, with some of the innovators here uh, so that they can discuss how some of these models or uh, practices could be implemented in their country. So we want a dedicated space to uh, bring those people together. So that's, that's the idea behind that one. Uh, and finally, um, you may have noticed um, there is a, as a camera at the back of the room. There's actually um, a, a film crew here from Czech uh, National Television uh, who we've um, uh, asked and kindly been agreed uh, by um, the, the local conference organizers are uh, going to make a short film about some of the work uh, that is going on in, uh, in Czech Republic. Um, and uh, in two parts, we're going to sort of try and demonstrate the impact of uh, using the quality rights approach at a national level um, and uh, hoping that this will um, provide additional uh, valuable evidence alongside the more quantitative kind of approach that uh, we often use. So, um, so I guess the, the message is they're there, that's why they're there, you know, ignore them, don't let them put you off. Um, uh, and uh, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to come and uh, see, see Melita or myself. Thanks very much, enjoy the conference. Back to you, Roberto. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and now we have uh, uh, some uh, <clears throat> welcome from, from some of the other organizations that have contributed I think so, to, uh, to this conference. So I will ask to come here to Alberto Trimboli, uh, John Jenkins, uh, uh, Shanta Rao Barriga, if she's here. Uh, and, and Jan Berns. So I think groups of two, please, <laughs> maybe. Maybe Alberto and John, if you can come. Uh, I would uh, also I'd like to, to mention this, uh, that there is a, some other big delegation of, of other countries. For instance, there is a delegation that I salute here from Catalonia. It's an official delegation from the Generalitat of Catalonia that is going to undertake a change in the organization of services, and we are very happy to host this group here. And uh, uh, as two years ago, a big, very big delegation from uh, California, particularly from Los Angeles, but not only from Los Angeles County, uh, because we are uh, going to have a, a twinning collaboration in the next five years about uh, uh, a complete change and uh, renewal of the services in this very important state of, of the USA, which is uh, one of the economical and intellectual uh, uh, influential, most influential places in the world. So uh, thank you, everybody. I certainly forget, forget some of the names uh, and, and, and of the countries, but uh, uh, this is the reason why I give, give to uh, have a, a say to uh, Alberto Trimboli, uh, who is representing a, a, a worldwide organization, which is the World Federation for Mental Health. Alberto. Grazie. Buongiorno. E per me è un enorme piacere condividere con voi questo momento. Voglio ringraziare al Centro di Collaborazione della OMS per la ricerca e la formazione sulla salute mentale ASUI Trieste e la OMS per l'organizzazione eccellente 
e specialmente a Roberto Mezzina per l'amabile invito a, partecipa a partecipare in questo evento e per l'ottimo lavoro che sta facendo. Porto il saluto della Federazione Mondiale per la Salute Mentale. Per me è un piacere partecipare rappresentando la Federazione Mondiale per contribuire insieme a tutti voi per eliminare lo stigma e l'esclusione nell'ambito della salute mentale e contribuire alla diffusione di esempi di buone pratiche di servizi basati sulla comunità territoriale, di comunità e di prospettiva di diritti. Sappiamo che nella maggioranza dei paesi non viene rispettato il diritto delle persone con malattia mentale a usufruire dei servizi sociosanitari delle loro comunità. La rappresentazione sociale e lo stigma negativo associato a questo problema generano attitudini e condotte discriminatorie e marginazione sociale sia nella società in generale che nel sistema di salute in particolare. Le persone che soffrono di malattia mentale e tossicodipendenza spesso sono escluse dai centri, centri di assistenza sanitaria e in molti casi non possono contare su servizi di salute mentale disponibili nelle loro comunità. Molte volte sono obbligate a fare uso di servizi che sono lontani da dove abitano, cosa che rende difficile e impedisce che i membri delle loro famiglie li accompagnino. Anche sappiamo che molte volte il manicomio è l'unica alternativa. alternativa. In questo contesto dobbiamo lavorare molto per evitare lo stigma in modo che le persone con soffrimento mentale e tossicodipendenze abbiano servizi della comunità accessibili e fuori degli ospedali psichiatrici. Psichiatrici. Ogni, oggi non ci sono dubbi che il miglior trattamento in salute mentale è quello che si realizza nel luogo in cui la persona vive e vicino ai suoi cari. Sappiamo che il lavoro che stanno svolgendo a Trieste è quasi un'eccezione eccezione nel mondo. Non c'è dubbio che il modello di Trieste sia il modello da imitare. Voglio finire con alcuni annunci. Il primo è che la Federazione Mondiale della Salute Mentale terrà il suo congresso mondiale a Buenos Aires dal 5 all'8 novembre. Al momento abbiamo più di 4.000 persone registrate provenienti da tutto il mondo, siete tutti invitati. Voglio anche invitarvi a partecipare alla presentazione insieme ai miei colleghi dell'Associazione Argentina per la Salute Mentale, dal lavoro di inclusione sociosanitaria che svogliamo presso l'Ospedale Generale Teodoro Álvarez di Buenos Aires. Tale attività sarà mercoledì alle 14, alle 2. Infine, voglio annunciare che Roberto Mezzina è stato nominato nuovo vicepresidente per Europa della Federazione Mondiale per la Salute Mentale per i prossimi due anni. Complimenti Roberto, ti meriti. Thank you John, thanks very much. And he, and he thought he was retiring. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm the CEO of the International Mental Health Collaborating Network. And Roberto and I started this with some other colleagues in Europe uh, nearly uh, 25 years ago. And as its name implies, it's about networking and people learning from each other, particularly about not only good practice, but best practice, such as we've seen here over the years in Trieste. 
We all know that over 200 years ago, society chose to deal with people with mental health problems in a very different way to the rest of society. And about, about 70 years ago, around the time actually that Law 180 was passed, we've been trying various means to change the situation of people actually not, hum their human rights not respected, their human rights abused and taken away, in, incarcerated in these institutions. And unfortunately, still, 70 years later, in many places in the world, this is still the case. And we've been trying to change this in a small way by uh, sharing good practice uh, and uh, uh, bringing uh, a different perspective, a different way of thinking about people with mental health issues, thinking in a very different way, a belief, a different belief that actually people can recover regardless of the degree of disability or distress, it is possible for people to recover or be on a recovery journey to improve their lives and their position in society. Unfortunately, this is not practiced everywhere, but we are still on the right trajectory of change. And change is painful for people, but it's absolutely necessary that people who actually provide services and work in services need a different thinking, a different perspective, and this belief that actually people can recover. So this conference, like many conferences that have been before in Trieste and other parts of the world, is a challenge to all of us to actually go back to our place of work and actually begin to change the thinking and therefore the practice and therefore the system. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, John and, and Alberto. Uh, so now I, I give, give the floor to uh, Jan Bernsen from Mental Health Europe. Uh, Shanta Rawar Bariga is here. I don't know if she's here. Anyway, she, she is not coming. She's not uh, arrived. But anyway, it's uh, from Human Rights Watch. We, we will uh, hear her presentation tomorrow. Uh, I'll ask also Fran Silvestri, Francesco Silvestri, to come here for the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership. So, and, and, uh, and that's it. So we finished with this uh, welcome. But I think it's important to give the space to some of the most influential and important organizations worldwide in mental health to to have a say at the beginning, uh, to setting the scene at the beginning of this conference. So please, uh, Jan Bernsen. Yes, okay, uh, welcome you all. Um, I am Jan Bernsen, president of Mental Health Europe and Brussels based um, organization for, to achieve the best mental health in Europe. And um, we've done some research the last few years and our report, Mapping Exclusion, you can find it on our website. And there is enough reason to, uh, to be uh, a little bit worried about the situation of mental health in, U in Europe, still, uh, unless we have a good practice here in, in Trieste and other places in Europe, there are still a lot of people are suffering uh, bad mental health care uh, in other countries. And not only in the poor countries, also in the rich countries, we have a lot to do. Uh, that's what we want to achieve with Mental Health Europe, and you're all welcome as a member of our organization. And, um, and it's important to spread the message, not only for these people, but for all the other people working in the mental health field who are not, in our vision, on the right way uh, of the best mental health care. So uh, um, I'm very glad to be here with Roberto. Um, I'm a little bit worried who is his predecessor, uh, <laughs> because we do some research with, with Fiest, and uh, so let's, let's hope we can uh, take the cooperation uh, on a good way further on. And uh, a last word to say is that Mental Health Europe starts his uh, activity uh, inspired by Basalia. He was in Brussels many times 
at the end of the 70s, and that was the beginning of a European, to build up a European organization for the best mental health. So it's good to be here, uh, I think, on the place where Mental Health Europe starts. Thank you. Franz Silvestri. Francesco. <laughs> Grazie, Roberto. Buongiorno. Um, uh, my name is Francesco Silvestri, and I, um, I sometimes have a habit when I come here, I mix la lingua, un parte italiano, parte inglese, and sometimes I don't even know I'm doing that. And I know if I do that now, it's going to cause problems with the translators. Uh, so I won't do that, I hope. Um, I, I'm the CEO of an organization called the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership, but I just want to say a few words more about being a personal leader and how, uh, what Trieste has meant to me. And I'll talk a little bit more about leadership tomorrow, what I look at for, for Trieste. But as a leader, this is a really amazing place. It's a, it's a beacon in the world of stability, of innovation. And I first came here in 1983. And I've been here only about seven times, but I come back here as a way of being able to find my uh, bearings. And I think that um, being a, um, a New Zealander and American, also with Italian descent, I'm really pleased to see the number of people from California here. Also, I have Vermont neighbors here, and also I'm really happy to see some Tasmanian leaders here, because I think that there's a lot to learn here in, um, in Trieste. But there's one thing I think most of you who are leaders here should also look when you're here the next three days, is the leadership capabilities that Roberto and his colleagues have that can be translated, not just the services, but how they lead. So welcome you, and I hope you have a really interesting, and I know you will have a great four days here. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, we start with, uh, now with uh, the works uh, of the conference, and I ask uh, Michelle Funk, to come here because she will, she, she will introduce us about the Quality Rights Program, which is a great program that the World Health Organization has undertaken for many years now so far. Uh, and she will talk about the, the state of the art of the Quality Rights Program, uh, as well as uh, uh, the scope of this conference because uh, Michelle and I worked uh, strictly uh, in designing uh, uh, what is going on in the next three days, and particularly the, the part which is relevant uh, that WHO has in this conference uh, asking us to contribute to set up a, a, a context where this can be discussed. So uh, uh, thank you, Michelle, for coming and for all the efforts you have put in this, the prepar preparation of this event. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Roberto. Um, do you want me to do that? Maybe I should move there. Yeah. So, yeah, in this session, I'd like to introduce you to the World Health Organization's Quality Rights Initiative, uh, and also some of the background which led to its development. And I think it's really important that the initiative is, is presented in a context. Um, and I'd, also, I'd really like to thank you, Roberto, for the generous time I've been allocated. It's nearly an hour, and normally I have to present everything in 20 minutes, and it's really quite a challenge. So you won't hear my voice all the time because I've got a couple of videos to present as well. But, and, and some of you in this room know about the Quality Rights Initiative and are actively implement, implementing it in your countries, and others are not but I hope that this will motivate you to also uh, spread quality rights in, in the different countries. So uh, quality rights is the World Health Organization's uh, global response to improving and incre increasing access to quality care and also to promote the human rights of people with mental health conditions, psychosocial disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and cognitive disabilities. So it's not an initiative that's just limited to people with mental health conditions and psychosocial disabilities. And it's really important to know that um, you know, people with intellectual disabilities and cognitive disabilities, people with dementia are facing many of the same barriers. So here is an initiative that can also promote their rights and access to quality care. 
Uh, we know that mental health services in countries all around the world are failing people, and we've heard that um, over and over again already in the, in the morning. And we know that from numerous publications and reports from countries themselves, from the UN, from NGOs, and from the media. And they're all highlighting the extensive violations um, and discrimination that people are experiencing. So we know that in the healthcare context, um, people are experiencing violence, abuse, and neglect. And these are the very places that people should be receiving support and good care. People are also given disempowering messages that take away all their hope and dignity, that they should not have a family, that uh, they should not work, that um, they should not have hopes and goals that the rest of the general population should have. It might lead to them, you know, that they're not capable, that it might lead to a risk of relapse. Um, if they fail to achieve their, their goals. But all of this has the impact of disempowering people and um, furthering their exclusion from society and not to lead lives that are meaningful. And that's why we're here. That gives us our will to keep living. Um, in the community, people are discriminated uh, in education, employment, housing and social services. And we know that guardianship Laws in many countries severely restrict people from making decisions on all aspects of their lives, their treatment, how they spend their money, um, where they want to live, and so on. So uh, adopting recovery and human rights-based approaches are going to be essential if we're going to change all of this. The recovery approach is ensuring that um, the services place people themselves at the center of care and anything that happens. Uh, it's about helping people to regain control of their identity in life, have hope for the future, to live a life that has meaning for them, whether that be through work, whether it be through relationships, community engagement, spirituality, all of them or some of them. Um, and, and I'd just like to comment that the recovery, and this is important, no, the recovery and human rights-based approaches are very much aligned because they both promote key rights such as equality, non-discrimination, legal capacity, informed consent, um, community inclusion, which are all enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. However, there is a difference, and that is that the human rights-based approach provides a legally binding framework which imposes obligations on countries to promote these rights and creates entitlements for people to claim their rights. So, the recovery person-centered approach is very important, it's very, very valid, and the human rights-based approach takes on all those principles as well, but it's legally binding and so it gives extra weight um, and, and puts on extra pressure on governments to make this a reality. So it's really important to use the human rights-based approach, not just to talk about violations, but to use the international human rights frameworks to change the mental health services. So basically it was in this context that quality rights was created in order to, to push forward this recovery and human rights based approach in countries. So probably not everyone in this room knows about the Convention um, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But it is important to understand it because it underpins all the work that we're doing in quality rights, its vision, its objectives and its actions. And it's particularly significant because 177 countries to date have ratified this specific convention. So it means that 177 governments around the world have important obligations to respect, protect and fulfill the convention. Now, um, although the convention outlines a full range of different rights for people with mental health conditions, psychosocial and cognitive disabilities, I'm just going to focus on a few of the critical rights which are particularly important in the context of mental health and which fundamentally challenge the current status, status quo in this area. So the first is legal capacity, which is outlined in Article 12 of the CRPD. And this requires that people with psychosocial disabilities be allowed to exercise their legal capacity on an equal basis 
with everyone else. So this means that people have the right to make decisions about all their treatment matters, all their financial decisions, personal affairs, where they want to live and so on. It means that they have this right to make decisions for themselves in all of these areas, even if they are experiencing a crisis. And this right cannot be taken away from them. Um, it also means that people cannot be treated against their will, known as involuntary uh, treatment. And it means that if people are having difficulty in making decisions, then they must be offered support to make choices and decisions, but only if they want support. So in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, um, this is referred to as supported decision making. It's completely different from guardianship and other substituted, um, substitute decision making models based on best interests that are in place in most countries where healthcare providers, families or court appointed persons make decisions for people. Um, there are different models of supported decision making in different parts of the world so there's a lot of flexibility <coughs> in how to implement that, and um, some of the models will be introduced during this conference. But the, the key issue here is no more taking decisions away. It's about supporting people to make their own decisions. The second um, principle and right uh, highlighted is liberty and security of person, Article 14, which essentially means that people cannot be admitted to services against their will. And this right is particularly important because it's calling for an end um, to the situation in all countries where people are involuntarily admitted and detained against their will in mental health services for days, for weeks, for months, um, and sometimes years. Uh, the Equality Rights Initiative and the guidance materials that we've developed around it show how we can implement Article 12 and Article 14, through concrete strategies, approaches, and mechanisms, including advanced directives and supported decision making. Uh, thirdly, uh, I want to highlight the right to live independently and be included in the community. This is something that probably everyone in the room knows um, very well and knows the best and much more familiar with in terms of the services to enable that. We're talking about not only uh, health services, but social in, um, interfacing with social welfare, housing, employment, and education. Um, and then finally, another key right is the right to health, which essentially requires that people with mental health conditions and psychosocial disabilities are provided with the same range, quality, and standard of care as everyone else, and that these are provided on the basis of free and informed consent. So all of these provisions in that international law mean that countries need to fundamentally change their laws, their policies, their services and practices in mental health and for people with a range of disabilities. Okay, so that is the background. Here is quality rights. Quality rights is working in several different areas to make this happen. It's building capacity to combat stigma and discrimination and to promote human rights and recovery. It's also working to create community-based services and supports that respect and promote um, human rights and recovery approaches. It's supporting civil society movements to empower people with lived experience and, um, and others to conduct advocacy and influence policy making. And it's working with governments to reform policies and laws in line with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with disabilities. So all these work areas are interconnected and they all need to be addressed if we're going to provide a responsive mental health system that people want to use and find helpful. We cannot just focus on one of those areas to the neglect of the other areas. So what I'm going to do now is introduce some of the materials and tools that we've developed as part of this initiative and also describe some of the country implementation work going on. So on this slide, you see the face-to-face um, -face training materials that we've developed as part of our capacity building efforts. 
Um, the modules that we've developed are all interrelated and work in a systematic way to build knowledge, improve attitudes, and develop new skills to promote recovery and human rights-oriented practices in mental health. All the modules that we've developed are grounded in the CRPD, so they're grounded in the international human rights framework, remember, that countries have obligations to implement. So on the left-hand side, I've got a list of the core modules, the so mental health, disability, human rights, and recovery. It starts off with human rights and then builds to human, uh, mental health, disability, and human rights. So starting off to help people understand broadly what does human rights mean and what does it mean in their context in a concrete way in their life. And then it starts to expand the knowledge to understand um, disability and mental health specifically from a human rights perspective. And then you can see we have three modules, and these are three modules dedicated to implementing this approach in the services. So, um, recovery and the right to health and mental health and social services, legal capacity and the right to decide in mental health and social services, as I have introduced in my introduction, and mental health and social services free from coercion, violence and abuse. So these are the modules to promote legal capacity, advance planning, support and decision making, and to stop coercion, violence, and abuse, and to promote that person-centered recovery approach. So they're the core modules on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we have some specialized modules which pick up on the issues from the core modules, but really take people in depth, so it's, um, they're much more comprehensive and in-depth focused on some of the key issues that need to change in mental health. Um, these materials are being used in countries around the world already in the earlier, their earlier form. And we've conducted evaluations of the materials that have shown dramatic attitudinal and practice change pre and post training across a variety of stakeholder groups in high, middle, and low income countries. I want to emphasize that all the modules have been, the modules have been developed in collaboration with more than 100 national and international actors, including organizations of persons with disabilities, NGOs, people with lived experience, family and care partners, and mental health professionals, policy makers, and academics. So it was truly a collaborative experience um, and endeavor where people's feedback and comments made a big difference. It's been through three large international reviews over um, several years, and a lot of the pilot work fed into the revisions that we made. Um, the other point to highlight is that this is training for all the stakeholder groups. So it's for people with lived experience and psychosocial disabilities, cognitive intellectual disabilities. It is for um, mental health practitioners, policymakers, NGOs, and DPOs. So the target group are all the different stakeholders. And if we're going to have a change in the services that we provide, we need to change that mentality of all the different stakeholder groups. Also to acknowledge that many people in this room are familiar with these materials because they have provided substantial feedback um, for their development. So in order to reach the scale that we need, we have also developed a really comprehensive e-training program on mental health, human rights and recovery. And the content of this e-training program is based on the set of face-to-face -face training modules that I introduced you to, that I just described. And it's this e-training program that's going to allow us to reach, engage, and train many more people within a much shorter period of time without the logistic problems and at a tiny fragment of the cost, which would have been possible through the face-to-face -face training. And here I'm talking um, about the potential to re reach thousands of people within countries and across countries with this e-training program. It doesn't have a limit to the capacity that we, of people that we can reach. Some of the key features of the e-training are short lessons and quizzes, so we don't have long, boring lectures, <laughs> like I'm doing now, as we see in the traditional e-training approaches. Um, we have gamification features, so users can complete 
challengers accumulate stars to appear on the top 20 leaderboard, amongst other features. We have discussion forums which provide opportunities for peer learning, sharing and coaching. And we also offer world certificates from the World Health Organization on successful completion of the course. It is a 15 hour course, so it's not a light e-training. It's comprehensive um, where we do see also dramatic changes in knowledge and um, attitudes, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I just wanted to give you, break my presentation and give you, um, show you just a brief infographic about some of the features of this e-training course. So if um, we could show the, the video, I would appreciate that.
Great. Well, the quality of the video wasn't that great, but normally the music is, people start dancing to the music. Here you're probably going, stop. <laughs> Um, so, the, look, we've had uh, incredible gauge, engagement on this e-training platform. Features are fun and great, but what's, what's even more critical is that our valuation is showing impressive pre- and post-training changes. So, when we started, we thought we just might get some, uh, when we were developing the e-training, the e we thought, oh, well, we'll get some improved knowledge, but in fact, we've got far more dramatic changes than we ever thought we would ever achieve in attitudes and, and the practices as well. So this is, it's hard to see everything up here, but um, we do have uh, attitudinal scale and um, on the 26 items and on all but four of those items, we had highly significant pre-post changes. Um, and not only were they significant at the 0. .0000 level, <laughs> The, the effect sizes that we got were mostly moderate, moderate to large. Oh, okay, moderate to large. So we're really excited about the potential for change with this. Um, let me just move on now to our quality rights assessment toolkit, which is being used in many different countries and also many of the Euro countries who are here today. Um, it basically outlines the quality and human rights standards to be achieved in mental health services and also helps guide countries on how to measure the standards. Um, they cover all the key issues of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, it's, I, I'm just going to do a quick overview. It's, um, there are five key things that get assessed, social and physical conditions, whether the service is promoting a recovery-based approach and addressing physical health needs, not just the mental health needs of people, whether legal capacity and supported decision-making is being addressed and advanced directives are being used, whether the service is free from violence, coercion and abuse, and whether it's promoting community inclusion. So these are all the areas get, that get assessed. What's even more exciting now is that we've just completed our new guidance on transforming services and promoting rights. So this is the guide that once people have done their service assessment, they use this guide to actually transform um, the service or to improve the service. Just to say here, we're not about fixing institutions. So if the, the conditions are really bad or if there's an institution, always the, the policy direction is to close institutions. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that now. But now with this, the guidance um, on transforming services and promoting rights, some of the key issues that we deal with through this guidance is changing the service culture and the power dynamics within the service. Defining a shared vision for the service and then working on specific priorities as identified during the assessment and developing an action plan to work on those. Um, and I'll just say also that all the other materials and tools that we I mentioned earlier, they were available in pilot form, but I'm really pleased to announce that they have really been finalized now down to the forward. So we'll be launching those in, in the next uh, several weeks. The new... Um, this is our new area of work. If we're going to develop a new system of services that respects and promotes rights and recovery, then we have to, for sure, improve the services that we have, but we also have to think about developing new services as well. Um, and this is our new phase of work, and we're in the process of developing a good practice um, service guidance on community-based mental health services and supports that operate without coercion, that respond to people's needs, support recovery, promote autonomy and inclusion. Um, and what we'll be doing is um, identifying, writing up those services, describing them and reporting on costs, outcomes, sustainability and transferability. The point to make here is that there are many services that are compliant with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and they operate therefore with recovery and human rights at their core. But the problem is, is that they remain at the margins and many policymakers don't know about them. Um, and in fact, many of the other, many, all the stakeholder groups don't know about them. So basically showing that these, these innovative good practice services exist 
Um, and our effective is going to be key to inspiring policymakers and other groups to take action and to implement these services in their countries. Um, it's really exciting that this work and guidance that we're developing has been identified by the World Health Organization as one of its key global goods. There's a new process that's been put in place within the organization at global, um, regional, and country level to define which are the, the core products we're going to focus on, and this has been. So we're going to expect, expect a lot of promotion of this good practice guidance once developed. Um, other tools that are ready, finalized, and published, um, guidance on peer support, one-to-one -one peer support, peer support groups, setting up and operating civil society organizations and putting in place uh, advocacy campaigns. We've also finalized our person-centered recovery planning for mental health and well-being. It's a self-help tool, taking people through a series of self-reflective exercises, templates, and tools to help people explore what recovery means for them, develop a plan for pursuing their dreams and goals, creating a wellness plan, and planning for difficult times, um, you know, a response for during and after a crisis. So really um, uh, integrating an advanced plan within the recovery tool. Um, it's been designed so people can use it on their own if they wish, but they can also um, use it in collaboration with others. For example, it can be used as a framework for dialogue and discussion. Um, between service providers and service users, should people wish. The other area of work which we've kick-started is around new guidance and checklists for a variety of policy issues, um, mental health-related legislation, national policies and action plans, community-based mental health services, and strategies for deinstitutionalization. And this is going to present some of the old guidance that we developed many years ago, which was formulated before coming in, the coming in force of the um, CRPD. So that we're going to see a lot more emphasis on legal capacity and supported decision making, community inclusion, empowerment, ending coercive practice and recovery approach. So we will see a very, very different looking guidance for policy and law, and that's going to be fundamental and actually quite a challenge because there's not one country in the world that has their law, which has a law which is compliant with the CRPD. So you can just imagine all the barriers we'll be facing. And now my favorite part is talking about what's happening in terms of implementation in countries. Country implementation is starting to expand quite rapidly. And we started with a small, with small pilot projects in different countries many years ago. Um, and then we had the opportunity to carry out a comprehensive statewide implementation of quality rights in the whole state of Gujarat in India between 2014 and 2016 in collaboration with Sumitra Patari, who was the lead on the project. And this was a hugely important project which involved quality rights assessments of services, the development of service transformation plans at each of the services, extensive training on human rights and recovery, the recruitment of peer support workers in the services, and the creation of peer support groups for people with lived experience and separate groups for families. And um, what was really fantastic is that the analyses of these activities have shown excellent results and impact. These have now been published in the British Journal of Psychiatry. It's shown that staff in the services showed substantially improved attitudes towards people using services. Service users reported um, feeling significantly more empowered and satisfied with the services being offered. And importantly, there were significant uh, improvements noted for all the different standards on the five themes of the Quality Rights toolkit, with Assessment Toolkit, which I introduced you to. And now we have moved on to a new phase. And just to say that when we were doing the work in Gujarat and in India, we did not have the e-training uh, platform. Now that we have the e-training platform, it's allowed us to expand and have much more impact in terms of what we're doing as well, much more reach. 
So now we've moved into um, a new phase of large-scale, countrywide implementation of the Quality Rights Initiative in 11 countries. That's really substantial, actually unheard of. In, if you look at the history of WHO, to do countrywide work. So the, it's um, from the African region. We have Ghana and Kenya, Southeast Asian region, Asia region. We have Indonesia, Western Pacific, Philippines, Middle East. We have Lebanon, and from Europe, led by Dan and Melita, Armenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Czech Republic, Estonia, um, Romania, and Turkey, and I hope I've not left anyone off that list. Um, so, what are the strategies, strategies that we're using for this country-wide rollout? Um, I've highlighted some of the key strategies here, setting up an implementation committee. The key thing here is that it's a mixed stakeholder group, all the different stakeholders working together for the rollout at national level. Second, establishing a group of national champions and getting them um, to record video messages promoting the Quality Rights Initiative and the e-training to be um, disseminated through social media. So national champions include ministers, people with lived experience, civil society representatives, well-known national personalities. So the idea is to promote the key messages around quality rights, but equally and even more important is to promote the e-training so all the different stakeholder groups will be doing it and through doing the e-training they're changing their knowledge attitudes and practices um, organizing national launch of the initiative um, developing comprehensive social media strategy here we really try and hire um, a expert in social media you really need that so they can really engage in a very professional way. Um, and then we also, as part of the overall strategy, is undertake complementary quality rights face-to-face -face training um, in the different countries. The whole point of the e-training, though, was so you wouldn't have to do face-to-face -face training throughout with all the stakeholders throughout the country. So basically, the idea is to train the key stakeholders and the main influencers in and then to follow up with the e-training for the, for the other groups. And then uh, the quality rights assessments and improvement transformation um, implementation of those um, plans as well in the mental health and social care strategies. So these are just some of the strategies which are being implemented in the countrywide rollouts. Um, depending on the country and where they are at overall, we also provide um, advice and support for policy and law reform with the new principles, as well as the creation of community-based services compliant with the CRPD. So what, is the, um, what are some of the results today? What are some of the early wins, for example? And I'm going to use um, Ghana to illustrate some of the early wins because they were the first country to implement a um, countrywide rollout. So basically, at the end of February uh, this year, we had a national launch of the Quality Rights Initiative, and there are about 800 stakeholders who were participating in that launch from all the stakeholder groups. Um, they established a uh, website, a quality rights website, where people could access the e-training, videos from champions, testimonials, and success stories. Um, we had video messages coming from the Minister for Gender and Social Protection, the Deputy Minister of Health, uh, WHO Chief Scientists, local celebrity, celebrities, musicians, people with lived experience, and so on, to encourage people to get engaged in the Quality Rights Initiative. Um, we had the rollout of a comprehensive social media campaign, which is ongoing, of course, involving Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and here are some of the results from the e-training uh, statistics at least. So basically within a five month period, we had 5,000 people who started the e-training and 4,000 people who had completed the course and who had been awarded the WHO certificate, which means by the end, in, in to be awarded a certificate, you actually have to get through the e-training um, uh, platform training program at a certain high level. You can't get awarded that certificate otherwise. So 4,000 people, that's a huge number of people within a short period of time. 
and the goal in uh, Ghana is to reach 50,000 people within three years. It, we would not have been able to do that through face-to-face -face training at all. We would not have had the finances to be able to roll that out. Um, and also, we would never have the guarantee that people actually listened and were, um, had improved their knowledge by the end of it, of a face-to-face -face training um, workshop. So what are we hearing? We are hearing lots of positive comments from people in Ghana during the e-training, as well as the face-to-face -face training, but this is from the e-training platform. And I haven't just selectively, yeah, I haven't just selectively taken out some comments. This is the standard comment that we're getting from people. Life-changing, most grateful to this special training for helping me to upgrade my professional knowledge. Wow, learning has taken place. I, you know, I hope I will never make the final decisions for people again. Um, I bowed my head down because I feel ashamed of how of how on numerous occasions I've used substitute decision making. Um, everyone needs to do this and coercion, violence and abuse. So as I said, these are just not select extracts. They're the standard comments that, I'm, um, that we are getting. I did have a couple of videos to show you, but uh, Roberto has reminded me that there should be time for questions and I, and I would Five, enjoy that. A few, yeah. So, um, yeah, basically, um, the quality isn't good anyway but of the videos, so here. So basically, let me end by saying that we've entered into a really exciting phase of work now with quality rights and seeing everything happen and be rolled out for the implementation in many different countries. Um, so people's commitment in countries where we're working to changing the status quo, to do things differently, to put putting in place practices, services, and policies that promote rights and recovery. All of that has been truly inspirational. To see the energy, the engagement in the countries is, is just amazing. And, but not only is it amazing, it, it's really proof that the stakeholders and, and countries around the world want change and are ready for that change. So I hope that I can engage everyone well as many people as want to be engaged in the Quality Rights Initiative to join this movement and to support WHO in, it, in its efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, for this comprehensive presentation. So now we, we know almost everything about the whole picture of quality rights, which is impressive. Uh, I think that it, there is some space for some questions from the audience, clarification, uh, request for information. Uh, uh, we can use the microphone. Someone wants to talk? Yeah. Please. Please Hello. Say, say your name, please. Yeah. Re Regina from Poland. My question is, if my country, Poland, is involved in this program, if not, how to be, in, uh, how to be in, involved? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, at the moment, the, the tools, the quality rights assessment tool is being translated into Polish, and there are plans to implement um, the assessments in a couple of different facilities. It hasn't been, this is not from the initiative of the Ministry of Health, and the best approach would be, of course, is if the Ministry of Health would make that request to the World Health Organization to, to roll out quality rights in Poland because that makes it easier for us to then collaborate in a much larger initiative that involves all the different uh, components that the other 11 countries are doing. But at least there is a start, there is um, an initiative starting to translate a limited number of the materials to do the quality rights assessments in some of the facilities. So if you have any ideas, then we would be very happy to speak with you. And of course, Dan and Melita may have a comment. Do you have a comment now to respond or later? Because they've been in contact with, yeah, okay. Thank you, other questions?
Good morning, my name is Don from the United States. Um, I'm very curious about the e-learning portal that you showed us. Um, it seems that the outreach for education would be wide sweeping from policymakers all the way down to clinicians at the granular level about how to adopt these philosophies. What granular level do these e-training modules get to um, or are they meant to be surface training? I am lost because I did not hear your question. It was yeah. interference with the microphone. I'm pretty loud. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> That's better. So I'm curious about the e-learning portal. It sounds as if um, the changes that you are, uh, the, the World Health Organization um, wants really go all the way down to that granular level of the commission. So the unique e-portals seem to affect uh, education all the way down to that level, or is this just a surface introduction for anyone, and then the granular level will get more involved as that country becomes more involved? You're, no, no, it's the idea of that e-training is to go right down to every single, well, we'd like to get to every single person, but it's to reach as many clinicians, many people with lived experience of mental health problems, all the NGOs, all the DPOs, people working in, in social services, families, all stakeholders. The idea is that the e-training reaches at the individual level for all those groups and the more people we can engage, the better. That's the plan. And the e-training has the capacity to do that. But we are doing it on a country-by-country country basis because it's an opportunity to engage the cup, all the different levels in a country to not just roll out the e-training, but to try um, to, to also bring other changes with the e-training, policy reform, law reform, service change, assessment. So, as I say, e-training is great and face-to-face -face training is great but you need changes at all the different levels so engaging which is and it's working really well the idea is country ownership it's the country's project and initiative and they are rolling it out to reach all the different stakeholders and the e-training is one part Thank you. <laughs> oh and and <laughs> You were loud, but I, I missed some of the nuance in your question. The e-training the e uh, program is very in-depth. So it's not a superficial coverage of the issues. It goes into depth on all of the issues, and it provides a lot of secondary resources to take people further. Okay? Okay, next question. <coughs> Hi, good morning. Chris Coe from Los Angeles. Thank you so much for your presentation. I thought what was most interesting was the legally enforceable, legally binding part of um, the rights. And I'm curious, is there a country in which that legally binding entitlement is in effect? And if so, who enforces that right? Um, the The... The challenge is that it's not yet happened. And as I said, we are just started now to start to rethink the law and the policies as guidance which we provide to countries. However, having said that, for example, Peru has recently changed their guardianship law. So there is no more guardianship law in Peru and everything is around supported decision-making, so that's happened in law. I know also in, so we should expect to see many changes now, and that's why a lot of the tools that we have now are gonna be crucial to make sure that implementation is, is happening in practice. Because you can change the law, but if people are at a loss to know what to do in terms of implementation, you won't, get the change you need to see. You'll just get the change in name. Oh yes, we're doing supported decision making, but in fact it is still substituted decision making. So both need to go together. And I know um, another example of a change in the law is in Georgia where now they have also scrapped their guardianship law pretty fundamentally, although Peru is a much greater, better example. But I know there are challenges in implementation. So 
What makes me really happy uh, and excited is that we have tools now, so we need to... The urgent need for us at WHO is to revise our previous guidance because still people are developing the laws and the policies in the same way as usual. But when we do that, we'll get some substantial changes. And in the meantime, we can be implementing all these other tools to change what's happening, practices and attitudes. Because if you actually change attitudes, it becomes easier to change the law as well, and people understand it. And there are some countries, like in the Philippines, they were saying to me, oh, I wish we had this training, done this training, before we actually did the law. But at least we have it now for the regulations, so we can improve it a bit. But once the law is set, you know, there's only limited to what you can do with the regulations. So anyway, we just have to take what we've got now and implement it, and we don't, we don't have the perfect scenario, but we can still move ahead. Thank you very much. Is there a question there? Thank you. I'm also from Los Angeles, and I had a question about the convention. Does the convention account for any kind of threshold or criteria of acuity beyond which someone is not considered capable of making uh, their own decisions? In the United States, our legal system has many different programs that use substitute decision making. And I'm trying to think here how we might be able to change those laws given that they are fundamentally based on a philosophy that there are acuity levels that beyond which people are not capable of making even supported decisions. Yeah, I mean, the whole point of the CRPD is that there is at no level is there any substitute decision making anymore. If someone um, has impaired decision making. So the CRPD says, yes, people have impaired decision making at different times in their life. But basically, if you have, if there is some impaired decision making, the, the government is obliged to provide that person with support to help them make decisions. So it might be a little support or it may be a lot of support, but that's the model. We provide support, we don't force. Now, if there are real problems with communication, that pers a person is unable to express themselves, or they might come to a service, they, they're not speaking, and um, no one can find their support network, all right? Or there is no advance plan available to draw upon if, if someone is not communicating. Um, if those measures are not in place, no advance plan, no support network, you don't even know who this person is, Basically, the idea is that you need to base decisions on um, the best interpretation of someone's will and preference, okay? So you're here, you have to do your best to understand that person's will and preference and make your decisions based on that. Now, you may not get it right, okay? But no one can hold people responsible for that. And the idea is, if you did get it right, that's fantastic. If you did not get it right, then when that person is able to express themselves, you need to put in the processes that this doesn't happen again. You understand, you get to know them, what their will and preference is, advance planning, try and build up a support network, so you don't end up in the situation where your best interpretation is not matching a person's real, um, their will and preferences. Thank you. As some last question, please. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Phil from Australia. G'day. Um, just wondering if it's possible to access the e-learning portals uh, as uh, if any of us can access them now. Um, uh, what we do now is give people, if they write to us, we will give them individual access, but it's not to spread the e-training, because as I say, our idea, if we can reach every country with a complete countrywide rollout, or at least a city-wide rollout, we will have much more opportunity to have impact 
um, in that country. So that's the reason it's not available for the world. If we did just make it available on the internet, we would lose our levers for change as well. But having said that, if there are people here who are interested in accessing the e-training, if you write to me, I will give you individual access. Thank you very much. So we have to close the session and, and thank you very much to Michelle for this great explanation. And uh, I would like just to underline that uh, it's a great opportunity, not just for professionals or for the people engaged in, in the legal aspects, but for all stakeholders to enter in this process, particularly in Italy, for instance, uh, family organizations can be part of this process uh, to ensure the rights and have training and be became more aware of the things that can be done. So thank you for this great introduction, Michelle. And now we have a, a quick stop till 11 o'clock. There is some coffee available outside. Please move your legs and <laughs> come back. Thank you.